Okay, we're going to get started with our, our next presentation. So thank you, everyone, for joining us at the World of Accordions, World Accordion Day and Palmer Festival celebration. We are in downtown Superior, Wisconsin. And thank you to everyone joining us on the live stream. And a reminder to people that are joining us on the live stream, there is a link that should be above my head if I set the buttons correctly. Uh, could you uh, p please uh, consider supporting the presentations and the, and the types of offerings that we are providing on weekends like this. This is funded through uh, donations from our supporters. So if you enjoy these types of presentations, please consider supporting us. One of the biggest costs of operating this facility is the building. So we need to maintain the building and we need to uh, pay for the utilities. Uh, and that's quite expensive. This is a, a, a large, uh, a grand building. It takes a pretty big space to fit over 2,000 accordions. And, and it's a gorgeous building. It has beautiful stained glass windows. We have a one year, and it just, it's something that needs upkeep. And just this past week, we were having some, some roofing work done uh, on one of the bell towers, uh, and that's an $8,900 bill. And it's just things that we, we have to keep up on if we're going to keep a facility like this open. So if you, if you enjoy the things you see here and enjoy visiting museums like this, please consider supporting it. Uh, that's how we keep this kind of thing going. So thank you for your support. Again, that link is on your screen, uh, so please, please check that out and, uh, and consider supporting us however you can. And a reminder, those, the, the, uh, any contributions you make are tax deductible. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Mike Middleton to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, everybody, for your support to the museum. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce our next speaker, a good friend of mine, Dr. Craig Funderburg, is a psychiatrist. He lives in Birmingham, Alabama, and he uh, has some unique skill sets. He's the guy who makes shirts like this, and so that's when I first met him, and we started talking. I ordered some shirts, and then we became friends. Eventually, he asked me to, he's the president 
of the uh, Alabama Accordion Association, and so he has a concert series. And I came to play for them a few years back, um, and that was a lot of fun, and uh, we had a great time. But uh, Dr. Funderburg's going to talk about a possible program of a accordion, an accordion degree, and he'll give the details. So let's give a big warm welcome to Dr. Craig Funderburg. Thank you. Okay. Uh, first slide. This is a beautiful analogy. There we go. Uh, life is like an accordion. You get what you squeeze out of it. The accordion owes its origin to the uh, Chinese mouth organ called a Qing. This occurred around 2700 B.C. And it works on the simple principle of blowing air across a reed. A mouth organ you might be more familiar with is the harmonica. Harmonica was um, invented in 1822 by Christian Boschman. Bush, I'm sorry, Bushman, thank you. Um, and also in 1822, um, next, um, back up please, um, uh, CFL Bushman. Uh, replaced the bellows on the accordion, or, I'm sorry, placed, added the bellows to the accordion. Uh, and I thought that was interesting that in 1822, both the harmonica was invented and the bellows were, were added to the accordion. Um, what is the function of the bellows? The uh, German musician and composer, uh, Hugo Hermann called the bellows the soul of the accordion because it provides the um, uh, articulation um, and um, phrasing to the, to the instrument. The left hand of the accordion provides the uh, force to operate the bellows. So what does, does a typical accordionist look like? So, um, May 6, 1829, um, a Viennese Cyril Demian added buttons to the left hand man. Chord is a chord, and people began calling the uh, instrument an accordion. Next slide. Okay. My memory aid to remember when is. World Accordion Day is that Cinco de Mayo always occurs on May 5th. And I think of Cinco de Mayo as the pre celebration to the celebration of World Accordion Day. So, my mem memory aid, when you're seeing all these signs advertising Cinco de Mayo, it's the pre celebration for the celebration of World Accordion Day. Uh, Fifteen years after the um, accordion was invented, a dance craze swept France and England. And this dance craze helped to uh, popularize the accordion. Does anybody know the name of that dance? Okay, the polka. Okay. The accordion can play both melody and harmony, so it became the prototype for the one man band. Uh, I think Mary Poppins has a, a one-man band in that movie. Okay. Uh, I believe you have a bouton downstairs. Yes. So if you visit uh, the World of, of Accordions Museum, you'll get to see the first piano accordion by Bouton in 1852. In 1883, Peter Tchaikovsky um, included uh, the accordion in suite number two in C major. In 1908, Guido Dare arrived in the United States and he was heralded as the world's foremost accordionist. 
1910, he's given credit for coining the term, term piano accordion. Now, Guido married a relatively unknown actress. She became um, a sultry, sexy, sex symbol, silver screen star. Um, does anybody know her name? Mae West. Okay. Mae West was the. Um, uh, I skipped the slide there. Okay. From 1908 to 1958, uh, was referred to as the golden age of the accordion. The highest paid vaudeville entertainer was Guido Dier. Let me say that again. The highest paid entertainer in the nation was an accordion player. The accordion became the most popular instrument in the nation. I looked at research books, and they had three accordion studios in a two-block distance in the city of San Francisco. So what made the accordion so popular? It was portable. It was originally developed as an alternative to the pipe organ. It's got tremendous range. It's got flexibility of dynamics and articulation. It can play both melody and harmony. And this Sardella bass, uh, which is based on the circle of fifths, makes it the perfect transposing instrument. That is, when you learn the fingering for one major scale, you've learned the fingering for all 12 major scales. So I, I described the accordion to people who asked me about it as the most perfectly designed musical instrument. It's based on the circle of fifths, and I have my little diagram here. For those not familiar with the circle of fifths, the accordion starts off with C, and the fifth note above C is G, and the fifth note above G is D and A. This is the fundamental row. The, the next row is called the counter bass because these those buttons are counter to the fundamental row. And we've slid the, the uh, notes down so that the third note is opposite the first note. So you have the first, third, and fifth notes together. This creates a circle of fifths. And one of the beautiful things about this, you start with C, and C has no sharps and flats in the scale. You go up one button to G. The G scale has one sharp. You go up another button, that's two buttons above C, it has two sharps. Three buttons, it has three sharps, so it's very progressive. If you go down from C to F, you're going in the flat direction, so the scale of F has one flat. The scale of B flat has two flats. So it makes it really easy to learn music theory, once again, because the accordion is the most perfectly designed instrument. Thank you. Okay, getting back to Mae West. Mae West was the originator of the one-liner and master of the double entendre. A double entendre, okay, is a word or phrase that, that can be taken with more than one meaning. Some of her, uh, when women go wrong, men go right after them. Okay? I didn't discover curves. I only uncovered them. The story goes that during an interview, Mae West was asked, what is the attraction between you, a sexy, sultry, silver screen star, and an accordion player? And in classic Mae West style, she, she flipped her hair back, gyrated her hips, and replied, honey, he pushes all the right buttons. There was a surge in accordion popularity. Women wanted men to learn to play the accordion. This advertisement shows if you want the perfect man, look for an accordion player. 
The first accordion concert was held and held in Carnegie Hall was in 1939 by Charles McNatty. In 1947, um, a talent show, the Philip Morris Talent Show, began, and a 17-year-old from Fresno, California, won the first week playing Lady of Spain and continued winning each week for the next 48 weeks, winning the grand prize playing Bumble Boogie. Uh, Mike gave away that information the other day. But does anybody know the name of that? The Cantina. Okay. And an important thing to recognize, this was really the pre-television era. So what we have is a radio audience. Okay? So there's Dick Contino. Um, next slide. The accordion was so popular, they were door-to-door -door salesmen going through the neighborhoods selling accordion lessons. The music minister at my church started taking accordion lessons uh, because a door-to-door -door salesman came to his house and his father bought accordion lessons. Uh, Keith went on to take uh, through book seven of Palmer Hughes, and frequently he'll play his accordion in our church service. Again, there was a surge in accordion popularity. Here's an, an example of an accordion school. Advertisements in the back of magazines would emphasize how everyone loves the accordion. Here's a magazine advertisement for the Honer Accordion. I described the accordion as the most perfectly designed instrument, and the lessons are fun. Music theory is easy because it is the most perfectly designed instrument. In 1948, the Ed Sullivan Show premiered and became the longest running variety show running 48 years. I'm sorry, 24 years. Gave my answer away. Um, the Elvis Presley appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show September 9, 1956. He was only televised from the waist up because at that time his gyrating hips were considered too risque. The Beatles appeared February 9th, 1964, and they only appeared four times on the Ed Sullivan Show. Uh, Dick Contino appeared a record 48 times on the Ed Sullivan Show. He averaged two appearances every year for the 24 years that the Ed Sullivan Show ran. Hanger. So who plays the accordion? Since the accordion plays both melody and harmony, a lot of uh, bands will first write their music using the accordion and then transpose it to their instruments. So the king of rock and roll played the accordion. Even while he was in the army in Germany, he played the accordion. One of the things that uh, Elvis knew was that the, chick, the um, accordion was a chick magnet. Uh, who else plays the accordion? The Beatles, John Lennon. The Beatles, uh, Paul McCartney. Here's a picture of Paul McCartney with his first accordion. Uh, the Beatles, Ringo Starr. Uh, Billy Joel, the piano man. Dennis DeYoung, uh, who formed the band Styx. Drew Carey. Does anybody recognize this young boy? Okay. Myron Florence. Next slide. Okay, Lawrence Welk. Dean Martin. President Ronald Reagan. Jimmy Stewart. Fred Astaire. Marlene Dietrich. Before Jimmy Dean sold sausage, he was a country western singer. President Richard Nixon. Lorna Anderson, uh, third place runner up in the 1957 uh, Miss America contest. Burt Parks, the MC, 
introduced her. She was the last contestant, the tenth contestant in the talent competition. And he introduced her by describing the accordion. Ask any child what instrument he would like to play the most, and chances are he will say an accordion. And again, there was another surge in accordion popularity. Um, people don't realize the accordion was the most popular instrument in the country until the electric guitar. Jory Musculin, uh, Riders in the Sky, he won a Grammy in 2001 for a Toy Story 2. Okay, so why did you select the accordion? Did you select it because it is the most perfectly designed instrument? The, the Stradello layout based on a circle of fists makes it a transposing instrument. It's portable. It can play both melody and harmony. The first accordion major was offered at Oklahoma City University, and the instructor was Louis Ronchetta. And this was in 1937. From 1946 to 1967, the University of Houston had a very popular accordion major. The major was so popular, you had to audition to get accepted. Uh, one of Dr. Palmer's first students was Bill Hughes. The first accordion book in the Palmer Hughes series was published in 1952. Uh, Dr. Palmer uh, developed the Quint freebase system on the on the uh, Tatal Emperor accordion. A couple of interesting facts: Paolo Soprani, uh, in 1997, was is credited with inventing the Stradella system. In 1946, Bill Palmer is credited with inventing the Quint free bass system. Uh, University of Missouri, Kansas City had their accordion program from two, 1961 to 2000, uh, chaired by John Cochran Summers. How many of y'all have seen this cartoon? Okay. Uh, true story. Mike Middleton's got this picture framed at his house. So his daughter Meredith was about seven years old, and he began trying to entice her to learn to play the accordion. And he asked her, Meredith, would you like to start taking accordion lessons? And the seven-year-old began to tear up and pointed to the picture and said, but Daddy, oh no, I don't want to go to hell. So. Meredith uh, took a harp lessons for seven years in public school and four years in college uh, before becoming a physician's assistant. Okay. So here's a picture of Meredith who, uh, it, I guess, not, is not going to hell. Um, now, have you ever heard of the accordion referred to as an orchestra in a box? Okay. Um, did you know that there are 188 schools in the nation that offer a harp major? This is the way Gary Larson should have drawn the cartoon. Welcome to heaven. Here's your accordion. It's an entire orchestra in a box. Welcome to hell. Here's your harp. It's a single instrument. So after school, after high school, what are your options? Here's a website that lists different schools and conservatories where you can get an accordion major. What country is missing? Okay. Currently, there's not a uh, university offering an accordion major. But that's about to change because the University of Alabama has accepted the proposal to offer an, an accordion major pending funding. The website is www.accordionpledgeua.net. We're not accepting any funds, just, just accepting pledges at this time. 
Here's a picture of the Moody School of Music. I thought it was interesting that the last graduate from the and the uh, music school at the University of Alabama is named after Frank Moody. Here's a picture of the uh, concert hall, which seats a thousand at the University of Alabama, and the recital hall, which seats 140. Remember, the uh, website is www.accordionpledgeua.net. Here's a picture of the website. As pledges are received, the barometer by the elephant will rise. Side trivia. Um, up here in Wisconsin, have you all heard of the University of Alabama football program? Okay. Did you know that Nick Saban, the, the head coach of Alabama, used to take accordion lessons? Just, just a little trivia there. Um, he realized if he started going to football practice, he could get out of taking lessons. So, that, that was, so uh, here's, a, here's a picture of the barometer as it's starting to rise with pledges. What's the value of endowing uh, a program? The funds for the program remain intact in perpetuity. Uh, which means that the funds are not used, just the interest off the funds. What we're looking at is to raise the, enough funds to uh, endow the chair and 10 scholarships, so we're guaranteeing a student, uh, guaranteeing a classroom full of students to the professor. I've gone to different uh, conventions over the years, and I've thought about, well, how much have I spent to attend each convention? I'd have uh, the cost to register for the convention, um, motel expenses, travel expenses, paying for meals um, while I'm at the convention. Think about, okay, that's how much I spent to attend one convention. If you pledge that amount to fund the accordion major, this would endow the program so that the United States would have an accordion program uh, to offer to its, to its students. An accordion is like an addictive drug. Uh, th this wife has realized that her husband is helping around the house and there must be an alternative motive. Any, any wives out there whose husband owns more than one accordion? Oh, oh. And, and without putting it back on the spot, how many does Mike Milton own? <laughs> okay. Well, think about how much money you spent on your accordions. And then, then place that amount. Um, I need $3.5 million. Well, if 3,500 according was, that would endow the program. Or if 350,000 accordion enthusiasts pledge $10, that would endow the program. If you are interested in pledging to the uh, accordion major, you want to maximize your dollar. And to try and keep numbers simple, if you had bought stock, $1,000 worth of stock, and you kept it for a number of years, and now that stock's worth $100,000, you'd owe about $32,000 in taxes. So if you sold that $100,000 worth of stock, you'd, you'd net about $68,000. But if you pledged that stock to the accordion major, the university would receive all $100,000. So uh, instead of um, selling your stock and then pledging cash, just pledge your stock to the university. To be competitive, we need feeder programs. Teachers 
uh, starting students at a young age have to prepare them to be competitive for a college level program which would be open to international students. And, and the, the United States is at a disadvantage because in other parts of the country, the, the accordion is regarded as, as a legitimate concert instrument. And so the international students are going to be uh, at, have an advantage. This is just like back in the 60s when soccer was first starting in the United States. Uh, United States students were not competitive in soccer. Um, but as soccer has progressed, uh, United States students, the feeder programs, have built uh, more competitive soccer players, and in like, we need to develop more competitive accordion players. Two years ago, when I started this thing, I stitched out a hat and I sent it to. President Reagan, I don't know if you, uh, no, President um, Trump, I sent, I sent it to President Trump, and I don't know if you ever saw him wearing the hat, uh, but we're trying to make accordions great again. Remember, the accordion was the most popular instrument in the country. There's an old Chinese proverb, steal a man's wallet and he'll be poor for a week. Give a man an accordion, and he'll be poor for the rest of his life. Just because you major in accordion at a university does not mean you have to become a professional musician. Uh, Dr. Drew Mays studied uh, piano in Germany, New York, and of course the University of Alabama. In 2007, he won the Van Cliburn International Piano Competition. He still gives concerts, but his day job, he's an ophthalmologist. Joseph Natoli got his bachelor's and master's in music theory and composition, and then he went to um, Franklin University and got a degree in, in uh, information technology and uh, an, an MBA, and he worked, worked in IT, and he's past president of the Accordion Teachers Guild. When I saw this cartoon, I thought, that that's Joe Natoli, and if you can read it, he was practicing his accordion next door to the judge, and the judge sentenced him to um, community service by playing for all these kids. So the uh, website is www.accordionplagueua.net. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. Was was Pietro and Guido related? Guido was the older brother. You know, I was reading The Golden Age of the Accordions, um, and I, they talk about 1908 being when Guido arrived here, but um, Fazzini was already here. Um, I think he was in, if I'm correct, he was in San Francisco already. 1905, he arrived here. It's one of the publicity things. You know, Frazzini was preceded Guido, but Guido got the credit. Okay. So, if there are no questions, I'll leave you with the most interesting man in the world. Yes, ma'am. Say that again, man. Um, to sustain the program, 
we're going to need students. That's when I was talking to, uh, that's one of my uh, efforts in presenting to the different conventions is to build uh, more interest and, and to the realization. You can go to school and get a degree in, in more than one area, and the area that you uh, get your degree in does not necessarily have to be the area that you, you wind up working in in, your, in life, uh, as with Drew Mays or with um, Joseph Natoli. Um, when I was talking with um, Joan Cochran Summers, I asked her, you know, what happened to the program? And her response was a de decline in students enrolling in the program. And that's one of the reasons uh, for trying to develop 10 scholarships is to ensure that you're, you're always pulling in the students. Um, uh, initially, I'm thinking that the international students are going to have a, uh, an advantage and likely qualify for the scholarships over local students. Um, yes, that would, that would uh, having some out of that caliber would, would be a tremendous draw. Could you repeat that comment? Uh, you're getting ahead of me. Um, I'm working right now to, to, to get Grayson over here next spring uh, for an interview. Yes. Um, all right. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you for that uh, uh, wonderful presentation. We appreciate that. Let's another round of applause, please. So th this concludes the, the performances and presentations up here, but I think we're doing a tour of the museum. Uh, so are we going to meet over here and just, just uh, in just a few minutes, we'll start the tour from the doors over here. So anyone that would like a, a tour of the museum uh, will be over here in just a couple minutes. Thank you.